And when you are seated, find Hebrews chapter 13. If you're using a Bible like this or some kind of mobile device, Hebrews chapter 13. There was a major survey taken several years ago, and the question was asked, do you believe you can be a good Christian without being involved in a church? Do you believe you can be a good Christian without being involved in a church? What do you think? 81% of Americans answered yes. Thanks. And a good answer to that question would be, what do you mean by church? So if you listen to the verses that were read just a few moments ago, it's a little more complicated than just giving a yes or no answer. Romans 16 says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Greet also the church in their house. So the church is a group of believers that meet in a house. 1 Corinthians 1.2 says to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. So the church is believers who meet in a house. And the church is also believers in a city like Memphis or Germantown or Collierville or Olive Branch, Cordova. Acts 9.31 says, so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. So the church is a group of believers that meet in a house, and it's a group of believers in a given city, and the church is also believers in a region, like the church's believers in Tennessee and Mississippi and Arkansas. Well, maybe not in Arkansas, but yeah. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Matthew 16, 18 says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. So the church is a group of believers in a house, the church is all believers in a city, the church is believers in a region, and the church is all believers everywhere over all time. So this thing of church is a little more complex than just, hey, it's the building where I go where they sing, and somebody preaches. In fact, the word church in the Bible is never used of a building. It's always used of people. First church building we can ever find, archaeologists have ever found, was in the third century in Syria. So the question, do you believe you can be a good Christian without being involved in church? At a macro level, the answer is no, because every believer is a part of the universal church. If you ever became a believer, you turn from your sins, put your faith in Christ, you were born again, you're a part of the invisible universal church, which is made up of all believers in all time, everywhere, all over the world. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and that's composed of every believer, everywhere, all time. So there's always going to be a church, and many are in heaven right now, already in glory, some on earth, all over the world. So you can't be a believer without being a part of the universal church, macro level, 50,000 feet. But I don't think that's what the survey was asking. I think they were asking micro level, local church, which is the visible, real-time expression of the universal church. And what I want to do this morning is do the best that I can to convince you that according to the Bible, according to the New Testament, God expects every believer to be involved with and belong to and be committed to a local church. Now, I need to clarify some things before I get started and into God's Word. And we're going to use a number of scriptures. We're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 13. We're not in a membership drive here. I really hope Everybody in this room will eventually join this church. But if you don't join this church, there are a lot of good churches in this area. There are a lot of good churches, have music, different different music styles and different preaching styles, but they're gospel-centered, they preach God's word. And so if you don't join here, I hope you join one of the other churches uh, in this area. We're just trying to do our best here to be committed to God, to his word, to, to worship him, and to produce deep believers and people who try to be that. And 
I completely get why many people don't want to commit to a local church. I really do get that. Before this building was a, a church building, it was a fitness center. First it was called Prairie Life, and then it was called the Omni. And I was a member of the fitness center here. Was anybody in this room, was anybody here a member of Omni? Yeah, look at that. I had a two-year membership here, and it began to go bad. Uh, the carpet got ripped up. The toilets wouldn't flush. Half the machines did not work over on the other side over there. Uh, the staff became rude. And I tried to get my membership um, uh, revoked or, or stopped. In fact, I wrote to corporate and I called them and I said, look, the Omni is not fulfilling their terms and I want my membership removed. And I couldn't get it removed. I had a bad experience with membership here. And some of us have had a bad experience with church membership. So if you've, and, and some of you have some real horror stories about church membership. I get that. I've got a few myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's my hope, it is my hope that you won't let the past ruin your present and your future and that you'll give it another run. And I know that some of us have a real problem with commitment. That's our culture. For some of us, commitment is simply having a card for pyros, and if we buy enough pizzas, we get a new one. Man, that's the level of commitment here. Some of us have a real problem with authority. We have authority issues. The idea of, being, of having Jesus as our, as our authority and submitting to him, that's one thing. We don't have an, have an issue with that. But the idea of following a human leader like in a church, we don't want anything to do with that. And for some of us, it's the idea that I want to pick and choose the best of diff, several different churches. So I go to this church because of their music, and then I'll run over to another church because I like the preaching. And by the way, I like to be a part of another church because I like the Sunday school class or the Bible study there. So we're like the honeybee that goes from one flower to another flower to another flower, but we like to make our own honey. So I, I get all of that. I, I really do. I understand that. And some of us say, well, hey, Sam, I attend here. Am I not a member? I've been attending for a year. I've been attending for two years. I've been attending for, two, for, for six months. Doesn't that make me a member? No, it really doesn't. You're an attender, and I'm really glad you're attending. I am. I'm glad you're attending. But there's a difference between being an attender and being a member. You say, well, what's the difference? It's the difference between living with someone and being married. And I can sum it up in one word. Commitment. You see, being a member of a church is a commitment to a group of people. It's a commitment to a group of people where you say, I'm going to work out the one another's of the Bible. Love one another, serve one another, accept one another, forgive one another, um, be accountable to one another, um, teach one another. About 50 of those one another's in, in the New Testament. The difference between attending and being a member is commitment. And what I want to do is I want to look into the New Testament and See what it says about this. And by the way, there is no verse in the Bible that says, join a church. You won't find the words church membership in the New Testament. What you find is the principles behind this. It's almost, there's an understanding in the writers of the New Testament where it's almost, it's like breathing. You don't have to say to yourself, now breathe. It's almost like your heart beating. You assume it. You don't say, now heart beat, heart beat, heart beat. No, you assume that it's going to beat. And in the New Testament, the writers assume you will belong to, be committed to, be a part of a church, a local church, which is why they don't speak about it a whole lot in those Terms. The whole idea of member, that word member comes out of being a member of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, that's where you find that word. So let's see if I can help us to understand that's the understanding of, of the New Testament. And what I want to do is I want to look at, see if this is biblical, and why 
The Bible says why the Bible teaches the principles there, why that's important. So Hebrews chapter 13, jump right in into it. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. And you probably have never heard this used in a sermon unless it was in a heavy-handed way, which is not the way I want to present it. I uh, hope you've if you've been around here, you, you, you've probably seen we're not that way here. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let me read that one more time. He's speaking to a local church. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they, and this is the reason why, for they're keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So he says, God has set up leaders in a church, people who set the pace, people who give, give direction in a church. And he says, they have a God-given authority. We're told to obey them and submit to them. It's, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. And then he says, don't wear them down that's no advantage to you if your spiritual leaders are like, Lord, these people are so hard to love. They are so hard to lead. Please give us grace to love them well or lead them to join Bellevue. <laughs> and here's the question. If you don't belong to a local church, what leaders are you supposed to submit to? Are you supposed to submit to the Mormon elder? who comes by your, your door? Do you submit to Jim Holland over at St. Patrick's Prez or to Kenan Vaughn over at Harvest or to uh, Chuck Herring at First Baptist Collierville? I mean, all these guys are my buddies. They're all good godly men. Who, who do you submit to? Let's say that Steve Gaines calls me and says, uh, Sam, he's a good friend, he says, Sam, um, I've been meeting with our staff and deacons and we all think that the orchard needs to change its name to Bellevue East. Do we have to obey that? Or do we say, uh, Steve, we've been meeting here and we think you ought to become Orchard West. I mean, who, if you're not a part of a local church, who, who, who do you submit? Who what leaders do you submit to? And by the way, who are these leaders that he's talking about here? They're local church elders. In Titus 1.5, Paul says this. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remains in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Paul had gone to this island of Crete. He had led some people to Christ and he leaves and he writes to his friend Tim, uh, uh, Titus and he says, I want you to go back in there. Things are really happening. Things are exploding. Lots of people coming to Christ and I want you to put some structure there. I want you to get some churches going and I want you to appoint leaders in every church. Get the thing organized. It's kind of going crazy right now. Get it organized and appoint some leaders there so that there's some organization so people can grow. That's how God is structuring the church. And not just anybody can be a leader. God doesn't want his, his leaders heavy-handed. 1 Timothy 3 gives qualifications for church leaders. It says, if anyone, 1 Timothy 3, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer or leader or elder, he aspires to a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So from the beginning, God's plan has been for Christians not to live separately, raising their kids all by their lonesome, but to come together in communities of faith. And in that community of faith, in that group, God raises up men to shepherd them, to care for them, to lead them. Why did he design it that way? That they keep watch over your souls. And that word keep watch is the word remain sleepless. Remain sleepless. I'm on a foundation that meets uh, twice a year in Dallas. 
So last week, Ruthie and I drove to Dallas for the meeting of the foundation. We stopped at Cracker Barrel and picked up a, a book on, uh, on uh, CDs. It was a book about how the war in the Pacific ended, World War II. And we're listening to it, and it describes uh, the fighting of the Marines on Iwo Jima and those other islands as they made their way toward Japan. And as I listened, I gave thanks for those the Marines, those men who fought those terrible battles on those islands. And he describes how the, the Marines at night, they were in those foxholes, and the enemy would, would sneak in. And at nighttime, the Marines were exhausted, and the enemy would come in those foxholes, and they would kill everybody in the foxholes. So what the Marines did is they were never in the foxholes alone. One man in a foxhole would stay awake all night long because the enemy's coming in. One man was awake all night long so that they would not be surprised. They're together in the foxhole, and one man is awake. And that is a picture of what the elders in the church, the leaders in the church are doing. They're keeping watch over the souls. They're sleepless. They're caring for, looking after. And he says, that's why I want you to obey them, submit to them. They are literally watching over you. But who are they watching over? Who am I going to give an account to someday? 1 Peter 5. Peter writes, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ as well as the partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, not willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, not, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the unfading crown of glory. I'm not given account for everybody in this area, but for the flock among us. I'm often given the opportunity to go speak in a number of different places. I will not give an account for the people that I get to speak to in a number of places. I'll give an account for the watching over that I give to the flock here. But if I don't know who is, I'm, who's here, who am I going to give an account to? Why do we need men to watch over our souls? Why can't we just live our independent Christian lives, raise our kids, pay our mortgages, live our Christian lives, do it all by ourselves? Why do we need the local church? Why? Revelation 12, 7. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now we know that Jesus was victorious at the cross over Satan, but the lake of fire has not been implemented yet. And according to this scripture, where is Satan right now? That's not a rhetorical question, not a trick question. Where is Satan right now? Where is he? Is Hollywood right? Is Satan sitting on his throne in hell drinking beer? I mean, where is he right now? He's on the earth with his angels right now, which is why the Bible says, Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, which is why 1 Peter 5 says, be watchful, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. The Bible says, Christians, be alert. You have an enemy. His name is the devil, and he is prowling around like a lion looking for someone to devour. This is a reality we don't think about, but we are in a war. We're in a battle. And we have an enemy, and he is smarter than we are, and he is more powerful than we are. You, Christian, have an enemy who is bigger than you are, more 
powerful than you are and more determined than you are. And he has one goal for your life, and that is to take you out. He is looking for someone to devour. And I've seen it happen, and you have seen it happen. Can Satan destroy your salvation? No. That's the gospel that was taken care of at the cross. And when you placed your faith in Christ, you turned from your sins and you embraced Jesus, that was taken care of. The victory was won at the cross. He cannot mess with that. But can he attack your marriage? Yes. Can he attack your kids? Yes. Read the book of Job. Can he attack your health? Yes. Read 2 Corinthians. Read Job. Can he attack your livelihood, go after your job? Yes. Can he go after your confidence, get your eyes off Christ? Yes, he can. Now, that happens without the sovereign control of God. We understand that, but Scripture is clear. He can and he does attack us. And God has designed a unique place of protection for his children. It is called the church. And he has raised up men to watch over your souls. He says, Sam, where do you get that in the Bible? I get it from where Paul talks about church discipline. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about a situation where there's a guy in the church who is involved in some really nasty stuff. Let me just read it to you. He said, it is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you. He's talking to a local church. Of a kind that's not tolerated even among pagans, a man has his father's wife. Here is a guy in the church who's actually sleeping with his either his mom or his stepmom. And he says, and you're arrogant. There, this church is saying, you know, God loves him. And who's to say what's right and wrong? And what happens between a, uh, two people uh, in private? That's up to them. And, and who knows what's right? And, and God loves them. And they're boasting about it. And Paul says, ought you rather not to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. In other words, kick him out of the church. He has no place in the body. This is called church discipline. Now, most churches don't do this because pastors are afraid they're going to lose people. How do you remove someone if he's just an attender, if he's not in the church? Hey, I'm just attending. You can't do that to me. I mean, church discipline doesn't work if you don't have some kind of membership. If, you don't, if some guy's not committed, it doesn't even work. And by the way, some people will say, this is not loving to treat people like this. No, the most loving thing a church can do sometimes when a person has repeatedly had people come and say, you can't live like this. This is not right. And he just refuses to listen. The most loving thing a church can do is to do this. This is like when your little daughter is playing in the street and you keep telling her, don't play in the street. And she says, I'm going to play in the street. You pick her up, you swat her on the bottom, you look her in the eye and say, you don't play in the street. It's the most loving thing you can do. And you don't want to see her cry, but it's a loving thing to do. And Paul goes on to say this, though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. And as, as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did this. Watch this. When you have assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. When the church is assembled, the power of the Lord Jesus is there. There's power there when the church assembles. And you got a guy who is sinning and he will not repent. Here's what you do. You remove him from the assembly where the power of the Lord Jesus is. And Satan can get at him then and have a field day with him. When he's out from under the protection of the church. And you hope his spirit is saved. And then Paul goes on to say, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. You'd have to go out of the world. I'm, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not to even eat with such a one. 
For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? How can you have people outside and inside if you don't have some kind of membership? God judges those outside, purge the evil person among you. And if someone here is thinking, well, I guess I'm outside because I've been sexually immoral. I'm greedy. He's not talking about you. He's talking about a person who says, I'm wiser than God. A person that other people, Christians have come to and said, please leave this sin. And that person says, I don't care what God says. I don't care what the church says. I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to live the way I want to. And finally, the only thing you can do to get his attention is you remove him from the church so Satan can get at him and have a field day with him. You remove him from the power of Jesus to protect him that's present in the church. Now, I want you to hear me for about 90 seconds. There are a lot of reasons why Christians struggle in life. Sometimes we struggle because of our own sin. Sometimes we struggle because of the sins of others. Sometimes we struggle because God lets things come into our life to turn him toward him. Sometimes we struggle and we don't know the reasons why. But this this hit me this week. Could it be that some of us are struggling in our marriages or our finances or our health. We're struggling with some sins. We are under an attack of Satan who is going after us unhindered because we have removed ourselves from the guidance and the protection of the church. No one is watching out for our souls. We come to church on Sunday, but we're doing life alone. Monday through Saturday, and the enemy is having a field day in our lives. You see, God set up the church that we might have somebody watching after our souls. And when I started this church back in 2010, I could have set it up any way I wanted to. I could have made myself a dictator. But I knew the scriptures, and I know my own weaknesses. And we set it up with elders, and I have submitted myself to the elders, and I'm accountable to them. And we've had ups and downs, and we're still trying to figure out how to do this. And last year, our elders said, we do not want to do management, as little management as we can. We want to do watch care over the souls of the people in this church. And in fact, this coming weekend, we're having an elder and executive staff retreat to figure out how to do it better. We take this seriously. How can we watch over the souls of the people in this church? Because when we gather, the power of the Lord Jesus is present. And this is heavy. And I know how the hearts of some of us are because I know people. And some of us say, I'm not going to have anybody watch over my souls. I'm not going to submit myself to anyone. And I just tell you, friends, if that's your heart, it's only a matter of time until Satan has a field day with you. Because having done this for a while, I can tell you story after story after story of people who have walked away from Jesus and walked away from their families and walked away from their kids and lost it all and trace it back every single time to a person who refused to be accountable to anyone. I don't mean you can't disagree with leadership. I don't mean you can't push back. Not that at all. And certainly I don't mean heavy-handed at all. I could show you, you know, I don't have time. I could show you so many other places of evidence of membership. Acts 2, you got a numerical record. They knew how many people were in the church. First Timothy 5, you got a record of widows. They had a list of widows who the church was caring for, who were part of the church. Uh, for Romans 16, there's an awareness of who is in the church. Acts 6, they have elections in the church. I want to end like this. Sometimes people say, I love Jesus, I just don't love the church. Think about that for a moment. I love Jesus, I just don't love the church. I love Jesus, I just don't love his wife. My wife is the most important person in the world to me. 
And she doesn't mean nearly as much to me as Jesus' wife means to him. You can't say you love me if you don't love my wife. And I'm not sure you can say you love Jesus if you don't love what he loves. Paul one day said, I want to paint a picture for you guys. I want to paint a little picture for you men of how you love your wives. This is how you love your wife. You love your wife the way Jesus loved his church. You can't say you love Jesus without loving his people because church is not so much the institution. It's people, his people, and he is nuts about his people. And I know, I know the church is ugly sometimes, and I know it's blemished and lots of failures and lots of sin because that's who we are. But when Jesus looks at his church, what he sees is what he's going to make of his people because he sees his people as one day being gorgeous, beautiful, unblemished, and he uses sinful guys like me and people like you and his word, and he is making us his beautiful bride. And he says, I want my people to love my bride as well and be committed to my bride. So, well, how does that work around this church? Well, April the 22nd, we have what we call starting point. That's the beginning place of being committed to this church. It's, it's a starting point of, of, of uh, membership. It happens right after the service, this service. And if God's spoken to you and that's your desire, um, I'd love for you to be a part of that. Would you stand in prayer with me, please? Let's stand together.